Okay, thanks, Pam. So we're off. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of October 25th, 2023. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I'm calling this meeting to order at 6.02 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. This planning board meeting is being held in the town room at the Amherst Town Hall. However, this is a hybrid meeting. Members of the planning board and members of the public pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, and as extended again by chapter two of the Acts of 2023, may access this meeting via Zoom. The Zoom meeting link is available on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting. Or you can go to the planning board's webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which has the Zoom link at the top of the page. Be aware that the in-person meeting will not be sus suspended or terminated if technological problems interrupt the virtual meeting, unless otherwise required by law. Every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so, despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, please answer affirmatively whether you are participating remotely or in person. Bruce Coldham is not here. We do expect him probably a little bit later. Fred Hartwell. Jesse Major. Uh, I, Doug Marshall, am present. Janet McGowan. Johanna Newman is has notified us she will be absent. And Karen Winter. Present. In person. Okay, uh, so in case not everybody could hear on the microphone or the recording, uh, we are all here this evening with the exception of Johanna and Bruce at the moment. For those participating remotely, please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will hope to see your request up on the screen and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. Planning board members who are present in the town room should also raise their hands when they wish to speak and the microphone will be passed to you. We have two microphones in the room, one at each end of the table. The general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during the general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting if deemed appropriate by the chair. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited or raise your hand if you are present in the town room. If you've joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with the guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. So our first item uh, on tonight's agenda, the time is 6.05, is a public comment period. Do we have any members of the public in present or on Zoom who wish to make a comment? Um, I do typically at this time, I read the names of the people on the Zoom call, uh, the, the public members. Uh, I see Jennifer Taub, I see Lily Bruce, I see Pam Rooney and Susanna Muspratt. There are a couple of members of the public present in the room with us. Okay, 
not seeing any hands from anyone of the public, we will go on to our second item, which is a discussion with UMass representatives, Nancy Buffon and Tony Maroulis. Uh, Nancy and Tony, welcome to our meeting this evening. The purpose of the of inviting you here was to answer some questions that the planning board members put together and I believe sent to you in, in advance. Uh, and also we wanted to discuss how the town and university can work together to develop more housing. Now I will, I wanna preface this by saying it had been my intention to step aside and let the vice chair or the clerk uh, moderate the discussion, but neither of them are in the room to, uh, yet at least. Uh, so I will moderate if I, to the extent I need to, but I will express no opinions. So with that, um, Maybe the way to do this, uh, we, we not everybody who's listening probably knows what the questions were. And uh, do you have, Nancy and Tony, do you have answers prepared for each question such that it might make sense for you to read the question and then read the answer? Or do we, do you, would that make sense? Yeah, I think uh, we were Go ahead, Nancy. From, sorry, good, good afternoon, evening. Um, I think we were hoping for more of a, conversation um, and we can, we'll have some specific um, answers throughout. Okay, so, so maybe we I will kick it off maybe if you want. I will read a, a question. You can start to answer and we can have a discussion. Can a little intro? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Okay, so hi everyone. I'm Nancy Buffone. I'm Associate Vice Chancellor for University Relations. I'm Tony Maroulis, Executive Director of Community and Strategic Initiatives. So together, Tony and I tag team community relations, and we're um, really um, happy to be here this evening. So thank you for that invitation. Um, we did get those questions ahead of time, which we really appreciate. Um, and um, we wanted to at least just start by talking a little bit about the planning process on campus, because um, it seemed like a number of the questions were about how projects um, start and get approved on campus. and. Um, so I thought that would be a good place for us to um, kick this off. So um, we do have a planning department on campus and they are responsible for looking at what our campus needs are and um, <clears throat> figuring, out how, figuring out how we can best meet those needs while also you know, staying um, within the parameters of the master plan that was created in 2012, I believe it was. Um, there is not necessarily one path that a, a project can take at the university. Projects develop um, through um, lots of different ways. Sometimes it could be, excuse me, a dean um, advocating to the chancellor and the provost that they um, have, you know, they might need a new building to help meet the needs of the workforce in the state. Um, that's in part how we got our computer science building, for instance. Um, sometimes we hear, um, from campus support units that are trying to meet the needs of our undergraduate and graduate students and they can't do it in the facilities. So that idea um, may come up through a certain vice chancellor, could come up in any number of ways. The planning department is also always looking at these things and trying to figure out how can we um, continue to advance the campus. Um, and then projects go through a, a fairly lengthy review process, um, ultimately, you know, there's approval at many different levels on the campus, and most of the projects um, also have to be approved through um, the Board of Trustees as well, especially when we're talking, you know, the larger capital projects. So it's a, you know, a number of the questions really looking at kind of what is that flow, and there isn't really one way that that happens. Um, there's lots of, lots of different ways, um, and ultimately it goes up through campus leadership up to the system leadership and the board of trustees. I think some of the other questions focused more on some of the numbers around our enrollment and housing. And so I'm gonna pass that off to Tony um, to. <clears throat> Which is great because Bruce just walked in, right? So um, uh, the timing I think was really great because a lot of the questions that Bruce had up on the what would be good to know um, we got it as a, uh, I think, a, a slide or you know something that was online, but we also hey, uh, Tony, haven't seen the picture. Can I just interrupt you a moment? Yeah, the time is 6.11. Bruce um, just walked in the room. So with that, 
Bruce, I'm going to turn you, this over to you to, to moderate this discussion. Okay. And Tony. Um, hi, Bruce. How are you? Um, so I'm going to hand out some uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, let's just just pass these around and the, the, the last can come to me. So we wanted to break out some numbers for everybody, um, some based up upon uh, Bruce's questions, what would be good to know, um, and then add some historical context to um, the UMass enrollment and bed count on campus. Um, and so you'll notice here that we were looking at 10 year snapshots starting in 1982. Um, we would have done 83 had we known we were going to get the updated numbers on enrollment for uh, 2023 in addition to what's on the back, which is our off-campus housing data for this semester. So let me kind of just start by um, noting a couple of things. And the reason why we went back to 82 is because it's interesting to note that from a raw in-person uh, number of students that we had in the area at the time, we're really not far off historically to where we are now. And I'll, I'll break that out because just because maybe this table might be a little bit confusing, but going back to 1982, our in-person enrollment was 24,939. Um, and we are pulling that from data that you'll see on the back. All the sources are there from our office of, um, of institutional research and that office name has changed, which, and I don't remember it, but Nancy can correct me a little bit later. Um, as you can see, you know, over the first, uh, you know, uh, 1992, 2002, there wasn't that much in the way of fluctuation with those numbers. Um, as you can see in 2002, um, continuing in professional education, which we're listing as online right there, had 700 students. That was really the beginning of um, what our UWW program has become now, which is fully online um, with, as you can see, robust numbers starting in 2012, 5,600 to now 4,390. Um, that of course affects our enrollment, right? So a lot of, um, you know, everyone is seeing the, our numbers go up and we're over 30,000 students, but a significant number of them are online, right? So I, I um, can't remember the percentage off the top of my head. Some math whizzes are, I think are gonna come up with this, but 4,523 people, um, 4,523, I can't say and, I was told by the nuns that taught me that you never say and, uh, but 4,523 students are completely online, which means that they could be anywhere and they are um, you know, professionals, they are um, perhaps homeowners. And, and I bring this up because as we talk about this from planning board purposes, the effect and the impact of those 4,500 is very different on our local population than our undergraduate number, for example, right? Our undergraduate in person. So I, I, I wanna bring that up. The other thing is you'll note, we've broken out the grad full-time and part-time students, right? And, and part of the reason for that is, is that uh, a graduate part-time student could be someone like me. Um, actually, I am uh, in a grad program right now, right? But I am a homeowner in Pelham. So I will factor into these numbers here, but I'm also a professional here that, you know, again, I think that when we think about impact, we're thinking about our full-time um, in-person student population. And so that's why, you know, we've broken this out a little bit. Um, and I think from a historical context standpoint, if you look at our full-time bachelors and full-time grad students, those numbers are somewhat similar to the numbers that we had in 1982. Um, I think that's kind of fascinating just from an in-person perspective. So we continue to grow, but um, but those numbers are largely online and that will continue. Um, so our numbers will always creep up. Um, as you can see, you know, I, I've listed the number of undergraduate beds that are on the side. Um, housing production was really quite slow until about 2006. Um, and at that point, We've had more than 3,500 beds. I think when you total this all up, it'll be over 4,000 over here. Um, part of that has been new production with North Apartments in 2006, Commonwealth Honors College in 2012. Um, we've done a lot with um, doing above design capacity within um, our current existing uh, buildings. Our normal capacity is 13,500. We found space through economy triples and converting lounges into 
um, about 14,000 beds as reflected in the 2022 numbers. Um, and then just this year, as you know, the project on Mass Ave, <clears throat> which the um, Fieldstone Slate, um, that undergraduate um, uh, apartment building, which is being managed by a, th uh, a third party, um, has about 624 units in there. Not all of them are occupied right now, but it has the capacity for that. Not units, I take that back, beds, 624 beds. Um, grad, the uh, Fieldstone Artisan, uh, which will open, uh, which is finished now, but will open uh, next uh, uh, school year, next academic year, uh, has about 200 beds. And then we have 300 beds for family housing up at University Village, which um, has opened in phases starting last academic year. So with that total capacity, we have gone up to about 15,000 counting our, um, our grad, undergrad, and family housing um, beds. Um, if you go to the back, um, one of the things that we're able to share with you and we're really excited about over the last couple of years since COVID, we've been able to better capture uh, data from uh, who's living off campus, right? This is something that prior to the last couple of years and prior to COVID, uh, we had really no good data on. Um, if you go back to the housing production plan that the town did in 2015, I think the estimate was about 4,500 students, graduate, um, undergraduate students were living off campus. Um, now we can give you better and um, uh, closer numbers. They may not be 100% accurate, but I think that we're, you know, within, uh, you know, uh, two or three percent, and uh, I think that's you know really quite important. And so, as you can see, we've broken this down by um, where students are living locally, and given you know local, we've defined it: Amherst and Pelham, Belchertown, Hadley, Shutesbury, Leverett, Sunderland. Um, those in Amherst and Pelham in the zero one zero zero two area code, um, zip code that is, are eighty nine thirty eight. Um, I could tell you that there are only twenty one that are living in Pelham. So, so just to be really clear, what 01002 is here, it's really referring to Amherst, not my town. Um, the undergrads living locally within all of those communities, 70, 7251, and in Amherst and Pelham, 6262. And, and again, take, take away 11 from there, and that's the Amherst number. Um, and some of those students are living at home, you know, as, as we know that um, we have a lot of students from Amherst. Um, uh, regional high school who um, have homes that are here and they also get counted in this number. It's not a major um, factor, however. Um, and then our graduate students living locally, and that includes part-time students, again, like me, 3475, um, and in Amherst and Pelham, 2662. So, um, you know, we hope that this gives you a better kind of snapshot. Now, one of the, the things that I think is interesting um, for you all to think about, and I'm only bringing this up as a caveat, is that you know the numbers, while very similar um, in in-person numbers from 1982 to now, in terms of that in-person number, I think the geographic spread and where our students are living is very, very different, right? Um, with the number of new units that have uh, been put online uh, by uh, private developers over the last uh, 10 to 15 years, I mean, going back to 2008, and I think Boltwood Place was really our first um, new development in town. I think there are about 1,500 units there. Um, that has not necessarily stemmed the tide, as we know, of the number of students that are living here. And in fact, I think that what we've seen is we've, uh, Amherst has added more, um, not only have they added more capacity, but more students are living close to campus, right? It's a proximity issue, um, which I think in some ways has cost towns like Sunderland that, that student rental business, right? And so um, it's surprising we were looking at our numbers today. Sunderland only had about a thousand undergraduate, I mean, I'm sorry, 550 undergraduate students that were living in Sunderland and another 550 or so grad students. Um, staggering considering the, the inventory in, in Sunderland. Um, so Amherst is absorbing more, which you know also I think accounts for some of the, the things that you're seeing with regard to single family um, homes, either still staying as rentals um, or, you know, in some cases, new conversions. So um, the other thing is, one, one other thing I just wanted to mention was, you know, there's a lot of talk about demand on campus. Um, we uh, think that that is tied to a number of different things that we're seeing across the country. 
Um, there are more students uh, during COVID and post COVID who wanted the on-campus experience. That has been a trend that has ticked upward. Um, and then secondly, I think uh, of note um, is when the pandemic happened, um, when students were sent home from the university, university refunded uh, a, a, a large portion of the uh, residential uh, life uh, bill for that the semester in which they were sent home. So there was a rebate there. And I think that you know there is, of course, the wise consumer that students and parents are now thinking about you know the safety of living on campus versus living off campus because that same uh, that same courtesy wasn't extended you know by those who were in 12 month leases off campus um, and we heard a lot about that during that period of time so you know there is something that that's also protective about that you know and that demand for on campus living so again just contextualizing a lot of what we've all heard um, but, uh, you know, we do know that, um, you know, we have a better sense of the numbers than we've ever had before. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's where I'll stop for now. And I guess there'll probably be more questions. Well, I guess, um, let's start with, uh, um, questions from the board. Let's uh, try questions of clarification first, just so that we, rather than the comments and so forth. Yes. That's all excellent, really helpful information, especially the numbers. Um, I guess I'm wondering about the UMass's thought process, if there is one, about what's the right number of beds to be on campus. So, so in an ideal world, would you house everybody? Or is there some target percentage that you go after? Um, and if I could interrupt, Jesse, what I'd prefer um, would be questions of clarification first and then larger questions like the one you're on. I just want to make sure that people understand the data that's presented and then uh, move to the, the larger uh, questions like that. So I'll hold my you... question. Uh, Nate, let's... Uh... Hi, thanks, Tony. Um, one question with the beds, the 3,500 beds, is that a net gain or is that is that taking into account, uh, for instance, you know, Fieldstone, you know, was any beds lost or there? University Village, is that, you know, are, is this all new beds? These are all new. Yep. Yeah. So that, that's a net so, gain of beds. Right. Yeah. Because um, if I, if I could, uh, here. Um, so it, it, it's a net gain because when the previous um, North Village was, was taken down, we lost those beds. We have added those beds now, and there are, there's more capacity in, at, at family housing than there was before. So, um, so there was a gain there. Um, so uh, we have about four thousand that we've four thousand in terms of what we've listed here. Even if you take away the graduate school from Lincoln Apartments and North Village, it's still over thirty five hundred. This is just the full bed count yeah. of what has been added. So that that's a great question, and um, we can clarify that a little bit more. Now the questions of clarification. I've got a couple, but I'll wait till the end. Maybe this is the end, Jen. So when you said that there's 500 beds, that's when you put three people in a double or you put a bedroom in a common room, which I, I've had friends of mine that's happened to their kids and they've transferred. Um, so that seems sort of misery to me. But, um, and you know, I think I was at a meeting of the housing trust probably before COVID where 800 extra students accepted and there was a big question about where they come because they're first year undergrads. And I think that happened again recently. So what do you do in those situations when you get a lot more acceptances? Where do they go? Trying to get questions of clarification. That falls into the same category as Jesse. You'll get used to me if I ever do this again. This is the way I work. Um, I, want, I have a couple. Uh, we'll be quick, it seems. So we'll, we'll get to both of you momentarily. Um, you said that since COVID, there was a trend and more students wanted, I, I wrote down, on-campus living experience. Did I understand that correctly? So that means on-campus, it just doesn't mean living in uh, rental housing around town. It means on-campus. Is that, do we understand you correctly? 
I think what we're saying is, is that the, just in general, there's just more demand for on-campus housing. Um, it doesn't mean that we're not meeting it. It's just that we're hearing more students yeah. who um, say that they want it, right? So we do house all of our first year students um, and about, I think 83% of our sophomores um, are housed on campus as well. And then mm -hmm. after that, you know, it's um, it's a mix and there's, I think a lottery system that goes into that. I, I don't wanna speak incorrectly on that. Um, but unlike in years past, and if you go back to 2017, when we were at a capacity of 13,500, we did have a 3% vacancy. And I'm, I'm saying that off at the top of my head and I'm 100% sure I'm right about that. So, um, so think you know there are trend lines, and trend lines have changed around student experience and and wanting to be on campus. And if they can't get there to campus, what I was also making the point of Bruce, just you know, for clarification here, um, you know, the idea of Sunderland not having as many bodies as they may have once had compared to Amherst now taking you know having more. It's because student, students want proximity if they can't be on campus. Okay. Can I just add to that in terms of, you know, the trends a little bit post, in whatever, I don't know if we're post COVID yet or not, but I, I think, you know, we're, we are, the students who are on campus now have, were all affected either in college or high school by COVID. And so one of the things that we are seeing, not just about housing, but, but a, about a lot of things, the students are looking for those experience, those traditional college experiences. And so I think that's part of why they there's this notion of we want to live on campus because they lost something, whether it was through high school or their early years of college. I've got two in college right now, and I'm seeing that in both of them, coming out in both of them in different ways. So it's really, it's part of it is that, you know, the financial piece of it and part of it is they lost, they think they lost something. And so they're trying to have that experience. So it'd be interesting to see what happens over the next few years as those students who are in high school when COVID hit, what their expectations are for college, you know, two, three, four years from now. Thanks, Nancy. Um, so uh, that's I, uh, a question of clarification, uh, Karen. So, to look at the numbers, I think what we're really concerned about to, to, is zeroing in on the amount of particularly undergraduates that we have and the capacity of houses that you have. And so right now it looks like you have almost 23,000 undergraduates for the bachelors and you have uh, 14,600 beds. So it's a huge sort of pool of undergraduates that are looking for houses, right? And that's, and so we call this meeting, I think, so that's a clarification thing. So I don't know if I can go on, but that's what we really want to zero on is how can we solve this? Yes. Okay. Backing up, I was starting to ask, is there a target percentage that UMass works towards? Like, yes, you built 3,500 beds in that period. Was that with an intentional, well, we need to meet this percentage? Or is it not that specific? Is it more just nebulous? We have this opportunity to build new beds, so we do. And, and the second half of that question is, if you had all the money and all the land, would you try and house all the 12,000 delta between students and beds currently, or is that not the goal? So it's a great question. I, so the number of beds that have been created since 2006 roughly mirror our plan for growth going back 10 years, which was, um, I think, you know, uh, raising the undergraduate total uh, about 3,000, right? So, so we've, we've met that. There's always been that gap, and that's, again, one of the reasons why we've you know, mention the historical data here. Um, two two major things to to keep in mind. Number one, um, state institutions generally do not um, house all of their students, and um, flagships uh, institutions and larger state institutions generally do not house all of their students. And um, as a percentage of 
students that we house, we house over 60%. I think our number is between 63 and 65% uh, percent in, in terms of what we house. Um, and I could be wrong because that, that has fluctuated over the years, you know, from, from 60 to 65. Um, so, you know, as, as, a, as a percentage, I think that we are in the top, top five or six uh, of institutions of our size uh, and, and the number of, of students that we house. The other aspect of this is that the, um, the housing journey is a continuum. Right for for many of our students, and and so living off campus is part of the experience. Um, the residential life experience is very important, particularly for student success, for the for first year students. You know, again, it's a, around the sense of belonging and bringing them in, and so that that is really intentional. Um, and then again, most of our sophomores do stay on campus, but the continuum is something that has always been a part of the. Um, public higher ed um, experience. And I don't think that that's ever going to change. As far as a target number, um, you know, it, these are conversations that happen all the time. And, um, and Nancy, jump in at any time. I don't have to hog this. But I think the one thing that we, uh, there, there are many factors that come into play. Any new housing production will take a few years to um, come online, no matter what we do. Um, so that's number one. We, we've chosen on the Mass Ave project to look at a public-private partnership opportunity because we are, you know, have to be concerned about our debt ratio, right? I think we can't go above 8%. Um, and, you know, we had a lot of academic buildings that had gone up over the last uh, decade or so um, to meet the needs of our students and their student success. So the public-private partnership was one one option that 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 we looked at, and and you know we did this um, this last go around that you know took a significant amount of time to get off the ground, um, and it still doesn't really meet our needs in the sense that even by adding those those units, we were still not able to take off many of the older units that need rehabilitation. So there's there's a lot to this, you know. So even if we expanded, you know, say. Tomorrow we we you know did Night Dream of Genie and expanded by three thousand. We'd probably at that same time have to take many units offline that that you know are past their useful life that need uh, real tender loving care. Um, if I can just add to that, you know, if you you know looking at the numbers, the the vast majority of our housing stock is older than it should be, and it also is not providing necessarily what the students are looking for. Um, and so when we're talking about recruiting students, what their living conditions are like is certainly something that's very important to them. And they're going to schools all around the country and they're seeing lots of different options. And so that's a really critical point that Tony made that as we you know, do add housing, at some point we need to take down some of the, the, the existing housing offline and renovate um, so that we can better meet the needs of the students. So it is going to be this, this ongoing challenge of, how do you make sure we have, you know, the housing that that um, we need to have, and making sure that um, the buildings are where we need them to be? And I, I just want to add, you know, ha having a son who's at Syracuse, um, my daughter was at UMass. Um, you know, every place is facing this the same issue. Um, you know, the housing stock at Syracuse is, is, is terrible. Uh, it's really bad, and and that's an expensive school. Um, so the so you know I, I bring this up because I, I think that that's one of the things that you know with um, with the way that the trends in higher ed when you know with the explosion of, of, of students going you know to um, four year institutions, many schools built a lot in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, and, and you know now with this aging stock that they haven't been able to keep up on. Um, we're all facing some of the same trends. Okay, um, Janet and then Karen. Um, I sort of changed my question. Are, is there um, more, do you have plans to build more dorm space? Like in the next, do you, I mean, are there dorm beds in the pipeline? And could you tell us those numbers? It seems like your students want to be on campus. They were in tents demanding on campus housing. So you have a plan and what does the next five or 10 years look like in terms of adding beds? 
Um, so, you know, I, I think that everything's being looked at, Janet, but I, I, I don't think that I can give you a definitive answer on that right now. Um, and so, so there, you know, options are being considered. Um, I think the institution is both taking a breath after the construction of, um, you know, both P3 projects, right? The uh, University Village and then also Fieldstone. Um, we have a new chancellor who um, has also just really um, come in, although he's, you know, um, on the ground and running. Um, I don't think that he has been able to think that through yet with his senior staff. So um, more to come on that. Um, but just on that note, I mean, one of the things that we do, Nancy and I meet with the town manager and the assistant town manager on a weekly basis. We have other plug-in meetings with, um, you know, with some of our um, staff from design and construction and, and facilities and, and some planning folks that are meeting with DPW and, and, and others. So, you know, as these plans do develop, you know, we're, we're talking them through in real time, but at this, at this time, we have no, nothing firm that I can talk about. Karen. Yeah. By the way, the, the new dorm, I think, is very attractive. We're really pleased walking around. It's great to see. Um, but Jesse's question was, in the ideal world, would you want to have a larger percentage of students living on campus? So would you want to? I mean, I realize that this would be like magic, and every country is having, I mean, every college is having that problem. But you see, as you expand the number of students to, in order to get, you know, universities are growing, the gap is getting bigger. And we're, in some ways, we're wondering what needs to be done in order to address this, what, what you can see and we can see as a stress on the town. I, I understand perfectly what's happening. I understand that you're, you know, the university's debt limit and things like that. But who is ultimately, um, who, who are the entities at the university that are saying, um, this gap is too big, we have to push for a dorm, we have to get the Senate or something that, you know, we have to have the funds. Who are the people that need to do that? So, so a couple things. I mean, one of the reasons why we, we've broken out the numbers this way and to show the in-person physical population is to, to show that the gap has not really changed in terms of physical numbers and percentage. No. And so if you, again, one of the things about the, you know, 31,750 number is that those online students, um, because they're online and fully online, um, they don't have the impact on the housing market uh, in the same way as the in-person undergraduate students do, right? And so I think that that's an important distinction to make. Twenty-two thousand eight hundred thirteen are the number of undergraduates. There are about fourteen thousand students that are on campus. You see what I'm see what so so we broke it out because I yeah. So, But, what, but that's always been the case. So if you go back to 1982, our bachelor's program had 19,226 and we had about 11,000 beds. We've always had a gap. One of the things that I was mentioning before um, is that one of the, the, the things that we have seen is with more housing production in Amherst um, and then existing rental, existing rentals never went away with more housing production, right? Um, some may have been, you know, con were converted back to single family homes, but that didn't happen in a major way. Um, and, and there have been many more that have been purchased <clears throat> with, the per with the express purpose of, of renting them. You're seeing more students in Amherst for sure, right? So the geographic spread of those that are living off campus, we probably have very few that are living in Northampton now, but in 1982, I would bet that there were a lot more in Northampton. So yes, there's always been a gap. It does seem like the last 10 years, it has increased some, and you guys have made beds to make the same percentage, which leaves the town to pick up that percentage too. 
essentially, right? Which is really what we're talking about. And and I think a lot of our conversations that I've been involved in are really about the pressure now of housing being converted converted from single family to rentals. So that's really one of the issues we're trying to deal with. Um, but what I wanted to ask you guys, and maybe you aren't in all the planning meetings, is part of the discussion of the UMass planning the consequences for the town of Amherst at all? Not only in student rentals, but also issues like young faculty can't afford to live in Amherst, right? I mean, I've been here 17 years. I could barely afford to live in town when we got here. Now there's no chance because of the rental market. And so is that a conversation that happens? I, I, clearly UMass is not gonna solve that problem. Uh, it'd be great, but that's not realistic. I'm wondering if that is just part of the discussion. A absolutely. And, and you know, we have a lot of conversations around the, you know, housing for undergraduate students, but we have just as many conversations about housing for faculty and staff, um, especially, you know, since the pandemic and the, the way the real, real estate market has changed so drastically. Um, it is a real issue and one that we are looking at all kinds of um, ideas on. So it is, everything is on the table for that. It, it's a big topic. And like you all, you know, we, we spend countless hours, Nancy and I, talking about this and thinking about this and working with our colleagues across campus and off campus as well, you know, around this issue. I mean, like we, we um, there are a number of things that, that factor in and faculty and staff housing is um, incredibly important. Um, I think that one, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of different pressures coming on the market. Um, you know, people that have moved here that are able to work remotely um, even a small percentage move, you know, changes the pressures in in a in a significant way. But we do know from, you know, conversations with real estate agents and with um, those who, uh, you know, are are property managers that they're seeing um, more folks from out of town than ever before. You know, wanting to live here because they can, um, and why not, right? I mean, in in many ways, I think that the issue with housing, both from the student perspective and from those that are moving in that are helping to drive up the, you know, the market is, is one of success, right? I mean, and I, and I mean that because people want to live here. Um, it's beautiful. There's, there's the, you know, cultural amenities that go along with that. Um, there's the opportunities to, you know, um, to retire here in place. There's, there's so many different things that, that come into this. Um, so it, it, it is a conversation. I, I, I can say, and I don't think it's a secret because um, he's already said this at the community breakfast and other forums, you know, the chancellor's thinking about this in a big way, as are the other five college presidents, right? And so um, I do believe that everyone is feeling the pressure. Um, I will also say last week I was down at the um, uh, Western Mass EDC developers conference when, you know, some young professionals that were in early stage financing just about to move to the next stage who are here because of the university and, and because of the, the type of talented workforce that's attracted here, they're struggling with the fact that they can't, you know, find the housing for the people that, you know, they want to hire. So it may force them to move, you know, so we, we, we do have these struggles and I, and I think, um, you know, we're aware of it. And, and I also know that, you know, we want to be part of the solution to it. Um, it's just not an easy one. So uh, at this point, I think I want to think about how to manage the, this conversation going forward. I, I came in late. I apologize for that. I also have been away for five weeks and my head in a totally different place. So this is a bit of a leap. Um, we have, uh, I, I, um, do we have a time when we want to complete this meeting? Is it the, uh, uh, is there a, is there a other, is there other business? So Bruce, most of these in-person meetings, we've tried to keep to about two hours. Uh, we do have a couple of items on the agenda after this. One is uh, a, probably a presentation from Nate and Chris to talk about the ideas for a housing overlay that they have prepared in, in, for our request. And then Fred was gonna talk about some of the tax advantages to owner occupancy and subdividable dwellings. So my in, in my head, although I hadn't said it, if we can finish this up by the top of the hour, um, that'll leave us an hour for those other things. And if we wanna extend those, great. 
but I, I hope we can get through this conversation in another 15 minutes. That's what I'm after. Uh, Chris, I'm, I'm also uh, note that we have uh, five, six people in the audience online and we've got three people in the room. Uh, I want to give some opportunity to, uh, for, 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 I, I think I do. I, I it, it might be uh, in 15 minutes that we have to take that uh, uh, the, the public comment or questions on this uh, somehow separately. Um, but I think I would ask uh, people to think now whether uh, if we have five or six, five or ten minutes at the end, between five two and five past the hour, uh, for public comment or public questions. Um, I'll, I'll see how that goes. That's that will be my aim. Uh, so that means we've got ten minutes uh, before we go into that kind of format. Chris. So I just wanted to mention to Nancy and Tony that we are going to be discussing um, the possibility of rezoning some land on University Drive. And we know that that um, kind of butts up against um, university land. And so we'd like to open a conversation about places where um, the town of Amherst can help to increase the housing stock that might be located near places where the university might also consider um, increasing housing stock. And that's not only University Drive, but it might also be um, North Pleasant Street as North Pleasant Street comes into the university. So I just wanted to put that out on the table and suggest that you may want to stay for part of that second conversation or catch up with us later about what we talked about. Thank you. And Chris, I, I think just because um, I probably want to go home, um, but but we will catch up. I, I think the um, one, one thing to note on both of those locations, uh, going back to the 20, uh, 2013 town gown steering committee, um, uh, when when you three advisors uh, was hired by both the town and the university, uh, those were two of the four options for housing that were uh, discussed and identified: um, University Drive and uh, what we at that time were calling the Gateway. Um, Mass Ave was another, and then also University Village. So um, so all of this, I think, um, you know, those conversations, I think, were you know would be welcome. Um, I want to ask, is there anybody in the public who feels they want to ask a question? I'm going to give people 30 seconds to 45 seconds to ask a question if they put their hands up. Uh, they don't have to do it right now, but do it in the next five minutes and I'll know. Okay. Oh, I, Elizabeth, I will get to you. It's just a note. It helps me manage the remaining time. That's all. Janet. So I'm glad you mentioned the town gown committee because everybody talks about it, but no one can say what happened to it or what it sort of seemed to have petered out. But this isn't a formal ask, but a lot of us have been on the planning board talking about ways to work with UMass about these issues and not just we appreciate you coming in, but kind of a more, you know, detailed way. So if, if there was, you know, one of our members, esteemed members had suggested that if we did more housing on University Drive, maybe UMass would build some more housing on the other side, their side, and utilize all those beautiful parking lots to, to get used unless there's a football game. And so maybe we could do some joint planning on what would that look like. Um, and so is that in the realm of possibility to sort of work with more planning professionals at UMass and say, okay, we're talking about this. What are your ideas? Um, I also just want to throw it out because I know there's some people from UMass here is that I feel like students need to be part of the, any conversation we have about student housing and, you know, rezoning and things like that, because there there are stakeholders as, like everybody else. But is there a way? I don't want to revive the town ground committee, which I think was thirty members, but is there a way for us to work more collaboratively with in the planning professionals? So, um, Janet, that's a great question. So, a couple things. I mean, UTAC is a little bit different than the town gown steering committee because UTAC came out of that. Um, yeah, we don't want to bring that one back necessarily. That was that was a little unwieldy. <laughs> but the um, within our strategic partnership agreement, which was just signed with the town, one of the things that is on the um, list of priorities is to have joint planning meetings. So this is something that you know 
Um, Nancy and I manage with the town manager. We certainly won't be the only people in the room. You know, the right people will be there. Um, and, you know, to identify priorities and ways in which we can work together, that will be the um, place that that happens. I don't know how that will work as it relates to um, the planning board. Um, you know, it is, it, this is more uh, arranged around professional staff after priorities are identified, but, um, but stay tuned because I think that there will be formal ways in which that happens. Um, I know we have a list of questions here. I think uh, I'd be interested to have anybody, uh, uh, members of the, of the, of the board, uh, who feel that some of these questions, I, I look at it quickly, I see that some of them have been answered. Some of them are questions that don't need to be necessarily answered publicly. They simply a matter of who is the right person to talk to and so forth. Um, uh, I think we answered a lot of those, Bruce, before you came in actually with Nancy's opening statement and then with our numbers. Thank you. Well, in that case, I'll ask, uh, uh, seeing nobody here, um, the, uh, on the sheet, uh, Tony, that you've given, over three, over 3,500 beds have been added on campus. Uh, I think uh, Nate asked whether they knew whether it's a net gain, and the answer was yes. No, um, uh, what, what I said was that the, um, the, to be very clear, the net gain is North Apartments, Commonwealth Honors College, um, the uh, above de design capacity, and the 624 beds for Fieldstone Slate. Um, the 200 for Artisan, which is not open yet, but is complete. And the 300 beds at University Village are replacement for graduate students. So it's still over 3,500. The total that you'll see here is over 4,000. I do think that those numbers are slightly elevated from the original North Village and the departments. So I think there is a little bit of now, but yeah, slight slight net gain, but but it's but there are some replacement in the grad school um, oh. and, and family housing. And and these uh, these five listed uh, uh, bullets are all housing uh, developments initiated by UMass. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So we we have yeah. other um, things that are happening around by the private developers, and, and that's correct. Um, okay, I I got some of those in my head. Um, I'm thinking, uh, this is a question, I guess, now, uh, about public-private uh, uh, development collaboratives. I talked to a number of, uh, uh, I, I, I made a, I am in the process of uh, trying to talk to uh, people in uh, your positions in uh, in towns and universities in about 15 uh, towns around the country that are uh, similar to Amherst. So I'm, I, I'm halfway, no, I'm a quarter of the way through that. I've got some sense that uh, some uh, places like Charlottesville, for example, have recently uh, committed quite heavily to um, public-private uh, partnerships, either by the, and in these various ways, of course, that what, and I think in Charlottesville, it's the universities providing the land, and then I think they are um, perhaps involved in the selection of the developer, but the developer then is moving forward and so forth. Um, is that a model that UMass has a history of working with, has an aspiration to work with? Yeah, Fieldstone um, is a public-private partnership. So the project that's on Mass Avenue and also the um, University Village is a public-private partnership. Uh, there are different, you know, uh, uh, each deal is a little bit different. With University Village, our residential life department is uh, managing those apartments. With Fieldstone, it's an independent operator that is that is managing it. So so those apartments there um, are are being managed by a company called Graystar. Jesse, just to follow up on that quickly, uh, something that came up I think our last meeting is that Fieldstone rents are sort of the highest around in a big radius. So my real question is, in those arrangements. Does UMass have any leverage on that side of things? So um, the the price um, per apartment was definitely a conversation throughout the entire process um, from the very, um, you know, the original drafting of the RFP to find a partner. Um, and it's something that's very important to our trustees is really focusing on, you know, what are the costs to the students? Um, so yes, that is that has always been part of it. The development company did set they set their own rates. Um, they also, you know, Fieldstone 
the construction started during COVID and, you know, the prices were just very expensive to build during COVID. So that is definitely impacting this. I do want to point out um, that those rents include a fully furnished apartment, all utilities included. The students don't pay for anything else. So it it is you know, the, the numbers I understand, they, they look very big, but they also include a lot of amenities. So a comparison to other places, you've got to look at what's included and, you know, what, what the student's paying extra for. Just quickly, yeah, I, I get that. What I'm thinking about really is a comparison to other off-campus housing. And that's way more, I think, than a lot of students will find in a single family house down the road on Lincoln. And and that's the real issue is that that those beds don't alleviate pressure on those houses or the need for more conversions or the profitability of more conversions. And so that's really what I'm thinking about. If part of the conversation with private public partnerships can be, oh, we need to keep the rents similar to what else is in town. Obviously that's a pipe dream, right? No developer is gonna do that. But if that could be the goal, that would actually help some of the problem. I think the only thing that we can add to that, Jesse, is that I, I, you know, I think that any future development, that consideration certainly is going to be, you know, high on the list. So, um, you know, I, I could just leave it at that. Yeah, I, I heard that it's only 50% occupied. Is that kind of true? Yeah. I mean, so really the, the crux of the problem is that if the rents go up so much, it's going to invite investors to buy the single family houses in Amherst and turn them into student rentals because their profit will be very high. And that means that no family can compete. And yes, we are a lot like the other flagship universities, but we only can compare ourselves to flagship universities in small towns that are as fragile as Amherst. And that's why we want to work together with you and create situations where we can find places for the house for the housing the students but save our town from going the way it is actually in actuality now going sunset avenue i live in the middle of town one house after another is sort of turning into a rental and you know the more that happens the more it's going to escalate it's not to the advantage of the university to have that happen or of of any of us. So that's why we have to work together to figure out how we're gonna take care of that gap. And I, I just wanna say, we agree as, uh, um, as far as the um, the occupancy of Fieldstone, that has a lot to do with uh, the completion date of the construction, which was still ongoing uh, because of materials uh, shortages, um, even uh, as students were moving in, right? So it was it was able to be occupied, but there was still some work to be done. Uh, we expect that to be fully occupied next year, but the prices are high and and, and your point um, still remains. And I think it's something on everyone's mind. So um, thank you for that. Um, Pam, can you bring Elizabeth Freeling? Elizabeth, uh, we're going to try and get you into the room here. Hi. Um, yes, Elizabeth Freeling, 36 Cottage Street. Thank you for having this discussion. Um, one thing I wondered about, uh, and I'm sorry, I missed the first part of the meeting, and that is whether or not the university is continuing to plan increase in enrollment, just to point out that even as few as 50 more students is, you know, 12 plus for new four bedroom apartments. Um, and then I also wondered if the university could in some way help more in monitoring the off campus housing stock that is occupied by students because all of this burden of the cost of monitoring, of permitting, of, um, you know, there are discussions about how this should happen, how we should monitor stock so that it's up to code, so that it's well maintained. And all of this falls on the town budget. Um, and I feel that the university needs to take a lot more responsibility not just for the students they house on campus, but for the students they're expecting us to house for them, for the towns to house for them, because all of the cost falls on the town. Um, I don't know if this is something that needs to be worked through 
state funding or some other recognition, but I just feel that I don't see the university taking real responsibility for um, the fact that they are expecting the towns to just absorb the students. Thank you. Um, so Elizabeth, hi. Um, just a couple of quick things. We we um, have broken down numbers um, again, and you know that that we provided to the planning board. I, I, I won't go into those enrollment numbers again, and hopefully, I think this will be replayed on Amherst Media at some point, yes. so you'll be able to see that. But the uh, the question about our off campus students, <clears throat> um, one of the things that uh, I just want to mention that uh, we have added to the strategic partnership agreement in this last year. Um, is uh, money uh, for the next four years, um, starting with this fiscal year, for uh, support of the Safe and Healthy Neighbors Neighborhood Program. Um, so that goes to either, um, you know, support the work of inspectors or, you know, the uh, the work that they do in terms of monitoring the permitting process, et cetera. So um, we have been very involved and we are very involved on a regular basis with our uh, town partners. Um, there are jurisdictional issues, but we often cross them in trying to find solutions. And, um, you know, I, I can happy to talk at another time with you and you can reach out um, to Nancy or me over in, in community relations and, and we can give you a breakdown of what's going on. Um, and um, we're actually, you know, really quite happy to do that at any time. Just don't want to take up the time of the, the planning board. It seems like it's a little bit out of the scope of that, but. Um, um, thank you, Tony. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, uh, we're at a point of stopping. Is do either any of the, th uh, the three of you in the room? I'm not seeing any hands. So at this point, I think I'll thank both of you very much uh, for coming. And uh, we hope we'll see more of you, or at least can talk to you. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're always being able to, to back. being able to get through to you on the phone or by email with specific questions would be helpful. I think certainly I'm feeling that personally. Um, I would just say call Nancy all the time. <laughs> I would say call Nancy all the time. <laughs> okay, I think I'm passing this now back to Doug. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Tony. All right, so the time is 7.04, and we can go on to the next item on our agenda, which uh, is uh, University Drive Potential Housing Overlay Zone, presentation and discussion about concept for an overlay zoning district to allow more housing with a mix of apartment buildings and mixed use buildings, along with just ideas for streetscape design. So Nate or Chris, do either of you wanna introduce the topic? So Chris is saying that Nate will introduce and he has some handouts, which he appears to be handing out here. And okay, thank you, Nate. Yeah, the first few pages are um, repetitive and deal, you know, um, I was in the packet, the last few pages, there's some with red font and then there's a second page. And so, um, right. So, you know, we had presented the idea of having an overlay on university drive for denser housing. So there's a, there's a sheet with bullet points. It's uh, dated October 19th and then revised the 23rd and 24th. And so we could walk through that. And so, you know, I think the idea was to allow, you know, an overlay zone to have flexibility for different, um, for denser housing. So, you know, what we have here in this bulleted list is things that staff came up with, um, you know, allowing mixed use buildings and apartments, but, you know, not capping the number of units in apartment buildings. 
um, you know, in, in this overlay, having mixed use buildings only required on the corners of streets and, you know, uh, capping the non-residential space at 20%, not 30%, what it is in the BG in downtown. Um, you know, we, you know, going down there, there is a sidewalk and there's a, a tree belt along the road and we'd like to keep that. And to do that, we need at least a 12 foot setback. So there's an access drive on the west side of University Drive. There's, um, and, you know, honestly, if we allow buildings to go right up to the setback, it would actually, most of those trees would have to be taken down because the property line is on the back side of the curb. Yes. Janet? Yeah. I forgot that we're at, um, do you want to keep that access drive? I couldn't tell from the drawing. Well, no, it's, well, what's interesting is the property line, if if you, um, on the west side of University Drive, the properties are right on the back side of the, of the tree island. And so I, I, you know, the sidewalk is about two or three feet. It's right near the road and it's crumbling. I, the proposal would be to get rid of the sidewalk that's there now. On the west side. On the west side. It's, you know, it's not functional. And actually what where you know, half of the access drive would become a pedestrian way. Have it be a 12 foot wide pedestrian way, north to south, all the way from, you know, route nine, all the way up to Amity. And so, so in essence it stays, but it, it's function changes. And, um, you know, and then we'd have to allow more curb cuts on University Drive to access development. And so, you know, the idea would be you try to take the cars off of it, but it becomes a pedestrian way. And so, um, you know, right now it's 18 feet, 20 feet wide. You know, we're saying reduce the width, but essentially keep it there, uh, have something there for pedestrians. And, you know, you'd have to establish crosswalks in certain locations. Um, you know, four story buildings, um, a maximum height of 51 feet. There'd be no footnote footnotes or waivers in the overlay. We try to just accommodate everything with, you know, dimensional standards, maybe some design standards and guidelines. Um, a few years ago, we looked at having a BL overlay where we had some design standards for buildings, you know, setbacks and facades, step backs if it's so long. And, you know, those are the types of things we would incorporate as we move this along. But, you know, the, the, the bullets here are really things that could be incorporated as standards and conditions in the overlay. So, you know, all utilities need to be screened from view. And we're not prescribing how if they're on the roof, you know, you have to design a parapet or a truss system so they're not visible. Um, you know, the design review principles would be applied. Um, uh, you know, law coverage would be 90%, you know, so that's something different. So essentially we're not, we're combining elements of what would be part of the BG and BVC and, you know, putting it in uh, this overlay. So right now, there's a few different zones that it covers base zones. And this would be an overlay that would be voluntary to use. Um, and so, you know, the second packet that's in this handout is newer development around New England. And it's, you know, taken most of it from Google, Google uh, Street View. Um, you know, there's stores, Connecticut, uh, there's Providence, there's Worcester. And so really this is to have the planning board look at this and, and, consider, you know, are there elements here that we'd like to see as part of design standards? You know, are there things here that we don't, that we don't actually really like the look of? And so I want to be realistic and say that, you know, we could take pictures of historic downtown Portland, Maine, or Amherst, but we're not going to get the Hastings building again. You know, it's just not, it's not going to happen. So for instance, on the second page, uh, we have Northampton Mass. It's uh, the two new buildings. The first one's uh, live 155 and then the lumber yard. And so, you know, the, the top building has, it's, it's difficult to see. You can see it in the, the recessed part. There is some, um, step back in the facade. So there's some relief around windows. They have, um, a flat roof with some detailing along the roof line. You know, they have storefronts along the street with some awnings. Um, you know, and so is that, are there, you know, are there elements there we could draw on? You know, Portland, Maine has seen a lot of building in the last few years. And so the next few pages are newer developments in Portland. And, you know, some are in districts where they hadn't had a lot of height. Most of the buildings are three and four stories. Uh, the second page in Portland is closer to downtown. One is right downtown. It's an all glass building, you know, right near historic brick buildings. And so again, it's just, you know, what, what are we envisioning for University Drive? And so, um, you know, what, what staff is thinking about with the overlay is that mixed use on the corners, and then we could have infill with apartments. So right now, apartments are capped at 24 units a building. In the overlay, we wouldn't have a cap. You could do an 80-unit apartment building. Um, 
you know, the, it's really what are the site constraints down there? There's parking, there's wetlands. So what, what could a site handle? Um, we're proposing at least a half space per unit ratio of parking. You know, that's something to consider is that, do we want one parking space at least per unit? That would really limit the density we get um, just because of, you know, lot size and everything else. And do we want everything to be paved? Is this a location where it is okay to have fewer parking spaces because of proximity to, you know, bus transit, UMass and Route 9 and other things? Um, you know, so what the list is, what, you know, there's a, a, a few notes on the back of the, of the bulleted list. You know, you know, we wouldn't have new classifications of housing. Um, you know, we could, you'd fit it into the use, residential use classifications we have now, a mixed use building or apartment. Um, a question is, do, does inclusionary zoning apply? Do we require affordable units down there? We could have it be an opt out. Maybe we have a payment in lieu of that's different than what we require now. And so, um, you know, that's, you know, that, that's kind of the basis of this. And so, you know, I seemed at the previous meeting, most of the planning board members were enthusiastic about looking at university drive and we're, we're developing some site concepts, but it's really using what's in the bullet list here. So, you know, a 12 foot setback along the streets, um, four stories, you know, mixed uses only on the corner and, you know, what, what really would a, a site look like? So if you take, um, you know, where the ROTC building is and the bicycle exchange, you know, and say someone, uh, the property right in the, the National Guard, the Na in National Guard, what, what could happen there? Is it 80 units? Is it, you know, and, and, and units is, it is different, you know, so a few years ago, it was three and four bedroom units were being built and now it's studios and ones, right? And I think the average size of a unit has shrunk. So, you know, what we're seeing is probably an average size unit might be five or 600 square feet because it's mostly studios, ones, and a few, and some twos. There's not a lot of three bedrooms. Do we, have a requirement that there has to be a certain percentage of three bedrooms in the overlay if they do something. I mean, you know, buildings over 50 units maybe have to have a certain percentage of three bedrooms. And so those, these are the kinds of things that we could put in the overlay. Um, the idea would be a site plan review. Uh, so it'd still be, there'd be a review process. Um, you know, and, it, and it's just kind of building on, you know, if we want to see redevelopment there, how can we incentivize it through zoning? Because right now it really isn't, um, the zoning doesn't allow for much. And so someone could come in and do maybe a few units with more parking, but it's like, is that a missed opportunity if this is the location for denser housing to allow it with an overlay? Karen. Yeah, I'm, this is so exciting. I, I like your ideas. Uh, I especially like the idea not to, uh, require so much parking there because my my hope is that this would really develop into a bicycle friendly corridor to the university and this this Wolfert Street for Living um, I also like that I've experienced that in Berlin it's a really safe way to bicycle and people can be out there I think the most important thing is to get the setback as as much as possible. And uh, they've already done such a beautiful job with planting those trees. It's already a lot prettier than a lot of the pictures that you see that have no green between the uh, house and you know the street. And think of yourself as somebody that wants to spend time there. It's only inviting if there is a big setback, if there are places to maybe sit in the front, if there's safe bicycling, not some bicycle thing that's crossed off on the road, but really it should either share the sidewalk or it should be something complete. Because I picture this as the place to live and to bicycle everywhere. It has easy access to the bicycle thing. But so many of your ideas I think are wonderful and exciting, really. They just, just quickly, yeah, I, I wasn't envisioning changing the, the roadway. So it's a really uh, wide right of way, it's a hundred feet. But on the west side, you know, it's about 12 to 18 feet from curb to back of, you know, to the to the drive aisle. And so, you know, really, I don't think that's wide enough to, you know, so right now, if, if we have a 12 foot setback and then the buildings are, you know, right on the setback line, it's anywhere from 25 to 30 feet from the edge of road, from the curb. And so it's set back quite a bit from the street. And so even a four story building, you know, it's not that close to the street. So I'm still envisioning University Drive would be relatively narrow with, you know, as narrow shoulders and there's no bike lanes on the road, it would be off, off road bike lanes and sidewalks. And so, 
you know, as opposed to like what happened on route nine, where you have a travel lane, a shoulder, a bike lane, and the pavement itself is really wide. The university drive would stay a narrow pavement and everything would be, you know, off. Jesse. Uh, yeah, I'm also pretty excited by most of this. A uh, couple of really questions out of ignorance. Um, one is is currently it's a ton of green or space there. And I'm wondering what are the zoning tools to plan in a park or two green spaces so it doesn't become just a wall, you know, solid developed area, because then it just makes it that much more attractive to live and just, I think, better overall. I don't know what those tools are. If if we need to designate up front, here's a park, here's gonna be a park, here's gonna be a park, whatever. You you probably have answers for that. Um the second question is also about the mixed use or commercial space. You said just on the corners as a requirement. What what do you mean by corners? Do you mean with each developed building? Or do you mean are there gonna be curb cuts and that's what you're calling corners? And and follow up on the commercial space. How do we incentivize that as a priority also? Because to be frank, I have not been impressed with what's happened in town with the commercial space in terms of adding to our town. Felt like it really added very little from the new buildings. Um, and I'd hate to see that happen here. It's such a great opportunity with tons of smaller stores, cafes, whatever. Yeah, so I think, um... The mixed use uh, question is a really good one. You know, so what we've heard from developers is right now we require 30%. There's no waiving of that. So you have to be at least 30%. And uh, in, in any part of town where you do a mixed use building, whether it's downtown or in village centers, you know, East Amherst, wherever you can do it. And uh, oftentimes they find that that's an impediment. They, they, they actually, you know, they, they'll build a building knowing that the residential units will subsidize the non-residential space for, you know, for years even until they can find a tenant. And so, you know, some of it would be if we require 30% on every building that's built down here, we're gonna have a lot of empty space. And so the requirement was say only on the corners, Amity and Route 9. It's not that you couldn't build a mixed use building anywhere else. We're just requiring it that on certain locations, and it could be mid block too. Maybe there's, we have a distance that every so many feet is required that you have a mixed use building, but Right now, the reason why people build mixed use buildings is there's no cap on number of units, right? So in an apartment building, it's 24. So they build a mixed use building so you can put in whatever, 50, 100 units. Um, you know, we think that here it could be okay to have apartments on the ground floor and it doesn't have to be, you know, mixed use along the whole stretch. And so, but I do think that's a really good consideration. You know, is, is there a distance requirement where we'd want to see a certain amount of retail or non-residential space as we're calling it? And so, you know, that's something that, you know, or do we have a requirement that there be a minimum and as you know, in every building, but maybe it could be waived and we have to, what are those requirements to have it be waived? Like something more strict than like, oh, I can't fill it, you know, give us a reason, um, you know, show us a pro, but you know, a pro forma, a budget pro forma, whatever it is, we could, you know, have some standards there. Um, in terms of open space, sometimes we do it by property and then, you know, or we could, uh, again, as an overlay, do we designate some places where we'd want to have, you know, community open space? It doesn't make sense for every development to have its own little dog park or whatever if we could have something else. And so, again, um, what's nice about an overlay is it's flexible in that respect. And so maybe we could consider how do we how do we have standards and conditions for that too? Janet. So um, I was I thought this was really interesting, and I would. Um, I did have a question about green spaces for people. I just pictured this wall of kind of dull apartment buildings and everybody, you know, getting on a bus or walking somewhere. I just, I just thought it, we'd, it doesn't really fit the fabric of Amherst and think about where it could be green. Although I do appreciate the, um, the line of trees. I also am somewhat, I'm somewhat afraid of the Dutch concept having tried to walk around it and constantly being like knocked over or jumping out of the way of really fast bicycles, usually like, parents with kids on the back. So I would like to see some sidewalks maybe that people can just walk on. I also had the idea of taking the access road and just covering it and making it kind of a covered walkway. And it could be, you know, a place that, you know, kind of a thorns marketplace, like an outdoor indoor marketplace. And then, you know, I just started to riff on all sorts of ideas. I think what we're trying to do here 
is probably what we're trying to, hopefully trying to do in other parts of town is to create a community. And, um, you know, and so I've talked to people who live in the PRP, the apartments that are in the research part, and they have a terrible time getting across. They can't go across the street. It's too dangerous. They have to get in their car to go to Stop and Shop or the Big Y. And the Stop and Shop is part of this kind of university drive village center. And so I thought to me, it was like, let's, instead of doing an overlay district, why not we just do some university drive village center planning and you know, involve the arbors and the people who live near there and the people who own properties and, and the people, who, all the people across the um, Route 9 in the apartment complexes and just say, you know, what do you want this to look like? And then when we have a vision of what we want there, we change the zoning to make that happen. And so I think this is a great start to sort of a larger vision. I mean, there's people who live in, is it Amity Place, the um, place that you live, Doug? You know, they, I'm sure they have ideas of what, you know, and the people, you know, about what they'd like to see happen in there and make things more walkable for them. So I would, I always thought this was a really exciting beginning. And I've actually talked to people who live in the um, apartments and they really want that whole area to be kind of become more alive and better. Bruce. Um, I agree. I read this a couple of times in the course of the day, um, uh, trying to uh, think, well, uh, what would I change or what would I suggest? How can I be clever? You know? And and uh, <laughs> I couldn't. I just kept reading it, and I thought, this is interesting. This is actually exciting. And the only thing that struck me in the course of the conversation the past few minutes is that uh, maybe there's some things in here that we could create as uh, discretionary, because I, I personally rather like, and I think when I was interviewed for this uh, position, I uh, uh, said so, that I rather like uh, uh, delegate, uh, uh, empowering planning boards with uh, discretionary powers. Now, I imagine there's uh, downsides to that. Um, I mean, it's probably giving a board, I'm guessing, uh, discretionary powers means more work for the staff because they have to advise and counsel. I'm guessing that that's a thing that planning staffs might not ideally want to do, I may be wrong. So the question is, would there be, uh, and I think I highlighted on this idea of, uh, or this, the, 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 the piece related to uh, concentration of, or, or provision of, of uh, uh, non-residential space on, on the first floors. And should it be 100%, should it be 30%, should it be a corner, should it be this, should it be that, it indicates that we don't really know. It's, it's uh, but the thing we're learning about, and it struck me that that might be a good candidate for uh, a discretionary uh, capability or a discretionary power of the board. And I thought in something as, 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 as wonderfully nuanced as all of this, that there might be place for uh, one or two uh, discretionary uh, uh, capability or, or uh, uh, requirements of the board rather than trying to guess the right number or the right percentage or the right whatever. Do you want to respond to that? I, I have comments too. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, uh, Bruce, those are good points. I, you know, right now, I think my thought would be if we didn't require mixed use buildings at some point, they just wouldn't be built if we change apartments to have no cap on the number of units because the housing market is so strong that a developer would just keep building apartments. They wouldn't build a mixed use building. And so perhaps we require it in certain locations, whether it's a distance or wherever, but then the percentage is discretionary, right? So I, I, maybe it's a little bit of both. Um, I agree. I think it's hard to have a firm number, even like what percent of open space, for instance, on a project when there could be so many site constraints that a lot of it's green anyways, because it's wetland or it's stormwater management, right? And so um, it might not, it's not going to become a big block of building if, you know, most of the, say, between properties is wet. And so I think, um, yeah, I, I think there could be an opportunity to do that, to, you know, to have something that's required, but we're not prescribing it in a way that, you know, it's a, a finite number. It's something that the board can then work with the, the, an applicant on. Jesse. 
maybe it's totally unavoidable, but something else my family talks about is, you know, what we lost in the carriage shops that didn't come back in terms of commercial spaces. Like that. The, 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 I mean, the stores that were there that did not come back to town, right? And so I'm thinking about this, you know, there's only a handful of smaller businesses that are there. Is there anything we can build in for them also as a plan? I just don't know. Did you want to respond or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's a that's a tough one. I think in the carriage shops, I think the, you know, the owner had kept the rents low, right? So it was it was affordable for those businesses. You know, once there's new development and there's costs, you know, that someone would say, well, it we don't the construction costs justify a different rent. And so, you know, I, I'm not sure, you know, there's probably some programs or, you know, there's, there are probably ways to deal with it, but I think it's hard um, to require it. I think the idea would be, how do we incentivize it? How can we incentivize small spaces? How can we incentivize um, smaller rents? And some of it would be, I'd say, well, allow more residential units to subsidize the non-residential space. So, so I had a couple of, reactions to this. Uh, um, first of all, my sort of dream had been that you had storefronts along the whole University Drive frontage. So, you know, limited mixed use, you know, those places where the apartments come right to the ground, are they going to kill the street? So I didn't know that. Um, I actually had hoped we could just we could we could ask for a larger percentage of commercial so that you know the CVS is which is there now moved into the first floor of you know some building with residences on top of it. Um, I was surprised by the four stories and not five because we've obviously got experience now both downtown and at the university with five story residential with or with mixed, which might be a way to incentivize, you know, if you can get to do five stories if you build the first floor as commercial, because um, that, that'd be net the same amount of apartments. So that, that was another reaction. Um, I was glad to see you, you, you thought a little bit more about parking, because that hadn't been in the first draft that we got. And, uh, you know, I don't know if, half a space is right, but uh, it, there's no doubt that even if you Monday through Friday ride your bike to work on the weekends, you probably want a car and you're either going to rent it or you're going to garage it somewhere. Now, maybe, maybe the, you know, maybe that sets up an incentive for somebody to build a separate garage. Um, and then the other thing yeah, I guess I wanted to I wanted to ask you, could you clarify because I'm actually a little unclear on where you're saying the property line is. Is the property line on one of the curbs of the drive aisle or is it on the curb of University Drive? Right. So um no the right of way ends 12 feet off the, you know, the curb on the road. So if where the red maples are, there's a if you're looking south on University Drive, there's a like a three-foot sidewalk and there's a line of red maples, and then there's the access drive. Yep. That first curb of the access drive is okay. the property line. Okay. So the eastern curb of the yep. access right. drive. Okay, great. Um yeah, I guess that's all I can think of at the moment. Yeah. I mean, I think Doug, your idea of allowing five stories but having requiring mixed use is something that would be is worth considering. And so um, I think, you know, the, the, whatever percent we could come up with is a minimum. Anyone can always do more, right? So even in our mixed use buildings now, someone could fill the whole first floor with a tenant. And so we're not, you know, the difficulty is when we're saying if it's a 30% minimum now, um, in the BG, that seems like it's fine, but in BVC and a lot of the village centers, we're hearing from developers saying we, we actually have a hard time getting 30%, um, same thing with parking. There are some developers who want one space for every unit, right? They will want, no matter what the requirement is, uh, if it's less, they'll always want to have at least one space per unit. Some might say, great, I'm, if I can do less, I'll do less. But there's probably some who want 
to at least have one space for every unit just for their tenants. And so, again, that's going to drive the site design, right? So someone might want, you know, if you could do a half space, maybe you could get 100 units on a property, but the developer's like, I actually want to do one space per unit, and I'm going to get 50, 50 units. And he, you know, changes the, the formula for that, for that design. Okay. I think Janet, you were next, and then Karen. So um, when we were changing the zoning on the parking requirements and mixed use buildings downtown, kind of a very busy summer, 30% was the lowest amount of um, commercial space of the towns we studied. So everything, everybody else was like 50, 80%. And if we're going to increase the density the, of, you know, if we go up to four stories, every, every one of those properties becomes more valuable. So there's, they have an increase in property value. And so if we're going to five stories, much more valuable. If we decide we don't have to do, we do less on the first floor for mixed use or lift the cap on apartment buildings, you know, it's it's much, much more valuable. And we, I think what, as, a, as a board and as a town, we asking for 30% commercial space is the, is the least of all the towns that we studied. And so I think that we need to make sure that if we're sort of giving an increase in value, we're encouraging development, that it's what we want. And so if you want to say you have to have a whole bunch of space for small shops, like the carriage shops, you'll always find those filled up over time. You know, look at, you know, Potline Village is filled with small shops. You know, Route 9 is filled with small shops. East Amherst is filled with small shops. It's the big, you know, the places down in Amherst Center that did not fill up are one really big expensive space. And, you know, I, I so I, I think that we can we can put in requirements if we're giving something and increasing the value and the profitability, the future profitability, we should say, yeah, we want green space. And green space isn't just a wetland because you can't walk into a wetland. You can't walk into, um, you know, what the stormwater, you know, drain system. And so, you know, you'd say, yeah, we want a park. We want some place where kids want to play uh, or people can just sit. And so I think we can, but I think this is planning. I think this is what do we want to see there? What kind of housing? I would suggest that if we go to four stories that they be peaked roofs. So it sort of fits in with the character and not just look like stores Connecticut, which is kind of unappealing. So I, I think that we have to do a planning process and decide what we want to, what we want to see. But it's not you and me. I think it's the, the community. And I really do think we have to go into a formal planning process. And I don't know if we can do it as a board or delegate it to a task force, but we have to talk to the community and we have to say, this is what we want to see. And um, and then if we're going to give increase the value of properties and future development values, money, profitability, we know there's some very deep pockets who want to come to Amherst and we can ask them for something, what we want, what we want to see. And I think we just have to do that. Aaron? Yeah, I, I do agree. A lot of people have a lot of good ideas. Um, I was just walking through downtown with my friend from Germany, and I said, you know, all these parking places, why is it we have all these pedestrian places in Germany? And she said, it's because we have garages. We build parking underground. She said, why don't these big apartments have uh, underground garages? And on university, we could say, for example, we want to keep or we could try to put it out there with the community, that one option would be that this would be a place where you could have a big parking garage. And the benefit is you have you, you don't pave over all this land and you have that green space that we need. Um, yeah. So I actually kind of disagree with a couple of the comments. So I'll just put that out there. Um, I'm really surprised to be talking about green space in that area because I don't really think of it as potentially being a family area. I think of it as being uh, uh, students and young professionals who, uh, you know, just moved to town. This is their first apartment and they want to be really close to the work or downtown and walk to the supermarket. So, um, and I realized that that group might want to have a park, but they can also go up the, up the hill to Kendrick Park. Um, and then um, I, I'm, I'm not convinced that we need a, a lengthy, broad public process. 
Um, you know, I think we have enough expertise at the table and with the staff to put forward uh, some ideas about how the zoning should change. And that we are, we've been empowered to do that by town council, by having us appointed. And, you know, I mean, we can put a vision out there. If, if, we, if, if we don't have a vision, then we don't really need to put anything out there. But it's clear Nate has some measure of vision because he's put it down on paper and um, we have reactions to that. So I don't feel the need partly because the people that are out in that community are busy building, living their own lives already. And they're not, you know, they're, they're not really thinking about what could be across the street. So there may be a few things you get out of that, but I, you know, we can easily put a vision to town council and, and then that might draw people of the public, including people in the community to make comments and then maybe it changes. Yeah, I mean, I think the, you know, um, I think the purpose of the overlay is something to consider. So, you know, originally when we spoke about this the other week, I said, you know, students only. And Doug said, well, why couldn't it be someone else? And so, you know, we it could be that this is just a student housing overlay and, you know, we can be more restrictive about who lives there. Or we say it's just an overlay and it could be whatever the market demands. And I think the market will probably be mostly students. But um so I think, but the purpose of it is important. So, you know, are, what are we looking at here? Is it, um, you know, are we trying to densify it and say, you know, my goal I said, I think was like, I'd love to see a thousand beds down here in the overlay. And maybe we start to change the housing equation a little bit. You know, it, it's gonna take a magnitude of, you know, that to do something. It's not gonna be, you know, a, a 20 units here, a converted dwelling here or something. It's gonna be, you know, something much bigger. and. You know, hearing Tony and Nancy tonight, I kind of agree that probably students are moving to Amherst or they want the proximity to UMass is important now, probably more than ever. And so, you know, I, it, as a regional uh, housing is a regional issue, but I think if 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 we had 5,000 more beds and there was 5,000 students living in 20 minutes away from UMass or half an hour, they're all going to come and live closer because that's just makes more sense. I think, you know, so I think it's a really hard problem to solve, but you know, I think if we densify East Amherst and we allow East Amherst to be bigger and denser, it's going to be mostly students. And so it's really hard. Zoning can allow for things. It's really hard to, to regulate the end user. And so, you know, our, we try to get creative with inclusionary zoning or doing certain things, but the market will kind of bear that. And so we can try to make it look nice. Maybe we try to um, incentivize things with, you know, you can say we have to have a percent of three bedrooms. You know, what what do we what can we do to try to get to the group, the end user we want, but I think is really difficult through zoning. So even to the point of like what kind of commercial space do we want? You know, we could say a percentage, maybe we want so many, so much glazing on the storefront or doors every so often, but that doesn't mean it's not going to be one big space with five doors. You know, even if we're thinking it's going to be five individual spaces, it's really hard to get into the interior layout of of it. And so um I mean, I think they're all things to consider. I, I mean, it's like, right, it, it'd be sad to think we're going to have, you know, a lot of new buildings here and have a lot of vacant real, you know, non-residential space, retail space, commercial space. At the same time, I'd say if we had that, we'd probably have a lot more square footage than we have now. If this gets built out and we have 50% of every new building is new non-residential space, it's probably more space than we have now um, that's there. I mean, it's, so it's just how do we even fill that? Go ahead, Janet. <laughs> Janet, what is me? I think if it was a student housing district, it would be a different, to me, I, I think it's like, what do we want to see there? And so the idea is, okay, it's a student housing district and what do students want? What would meet their needs? Um, you know, we're just looking for beds that UMass isn't providing or maybe UMass decides to put continue the beds in the other side. Like, I'm fine with that. Um, I'm not fine with not telling anybody in the area about it. And I'm happy to go and knock on the Arbor's door and to say, we're thinking about adding a thousand beds in here. What do you think? I mean, you know, I, I will just wind up doing that because that's my personality, but I think it'd be a nice gesture for the planning board to speak to the community. I think this is just a normal planning process I see in every other community. So I hope it's not a shocking suggestion. I think it is more interesting as a student housing district. I was on one of those 
International University Housing Crisis. I, I don't know, I can never remember the name. And there was this Canadian city that had three colleges and universities in a triangle, and they just decided to just zone the hell out of the middle and make it a student housing area. They went to like 14 stories, or they built 14,000 units, and prices went way up, and the vacancy rate was really low, and it didn't solve the rental problem in the area. And so, you know, so I think, you know, and the way I look at this whole process, I keep on thinking about a three-legged stool. We build more student housing. We build increased density in the village centers, hopefully more mixed housing. The university builds more housing, and then we have to put some controls in to protect the neighborhoods. Um, the mix of too many students in the neighborhood is very negative, and we had to figure out some way to regulate that and make it more of a mixed experience, more integrated. Um, so I'm totally in favor of making University Drive a student housing district. It does change the way I look at it instead of thinking about it as a village center. But I think we have to be clear about our goals and we have to consult the people who live around there. Jesse. Thanks. Um, I was just going to add, I guess, perspective sort of halfway. When I was thinking about green spaces or a park and smaller commercial spaces, I'm also thinking selfishly. Yes, I think it's a great place to try and convince lots of more student housing, and that's what developers will build. But I'm guessing I'm not the only one who goes down there three times a week. And I want to keep doing that. And I'd like that, oh, there's a new sandwich shop. I'm going to go get a sandwich and then go sit in the park and eat it. Like, I want that to be an interactive place, maybe not as much as a town center that we're designing. But if we don't put that opportunity there, it definitely won't happen. If we say, okay, no commercial space needed for the majority of that stretch, it won't happen because of what you just pointed out. They're just going to build beds because that's what's most profitable right now. So I do think we should structure that in as best we can to make it uh, an attractive addition for people who live here, not just students. Yeah. Um, I've said this before at planning board meetings. Um, I, for one, am uh, alarmed at the uh, uh, disproportionate uh, reliance of Amherst on uh, residential uh, occupancy in its tax base. And uh, so I, I look at this, yeah, it's a, it's a great opportunity for uh, adding uh, student beds. I, I get that, but uh, I don't want to lose sight of uh, the, the opportunities presented here for uh, commercial space, especially on the first floor. Um, and anything that we can do, uh, it'll be marginal, but if we can do anything, that will pay enormous dividends in terms of the financial stability of the town. Okay, Chris, I see your hand. And we're getting to the point where I'm wondering if we're gonna be able to wrap up soon or not. Go ahead, Chris. So that's what I wanted to address. We had a tentative date of November 29th for a fourth in-person meeting to talk about housing. Um, I wonder if you want to consider that as um, a means for continuing this conversation. And we have plans to go back and come up with some plans to show you how buildings, how big buildings might be, both in two dimensions and possibly in three dimensions if we can get around to it. But um, would you consider having another meeting on November 29th to continue this conversation? So is that the Wednesday after Thanksgiving? Okay. Yeah, and I think, you know, the images of the buildings, I'm, I'm not sure that was in the packet. If not, I mean, I think, you know, you can always email Chris or myself with comments. And so that was, they're really in here to, for that, to start a conversation. You know, what are, you know, I mean, honestly, I put stores in because often people say they don't like it. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, they're tall buildings. They're big buildings. Is that, do we like five or six stories? I mean, I, you know, I don't want to play, show my hand, but right. It's like, you know, we can't show everything that we think is nice. Um, so, but so anyways, yeah, go through the, the packet. And if there's things that you, you like, or you think are missing, um, you know, that those are, can be part of the, you know, 
the discussion. I will say um, on a different um, topic, we have you know, the request for proposals for downtown design standards is out there to seek a consultant and the proposals are due at the end of the month. And so, you know, the hope would be that by the end of the year, we have someone on board who is starting a process to look at, you know, downtown design standards. And I think that, you know, what we come up with through that could be adapted for here. And it, you know, may, the timing may not overlap, but I think, you know, we could get pretty quickly a sense for what they're looking at in terms of design standards for downtown. And all right, Janet. I think Jesse brought this up at the last meeting about talking about, you know, the ways to protect neighborhoods. Um, and I think maybe the 30th, we can do half of it talking about this and the other half about the different mechanisms in terms of making sure that neighborhoods just don't flip. And I, I, I get a daily email from um, Northampton Realtor and an Amherst Realtor. And every week it's like investors take note in Amherst, but it, they don't say that in Northampton, even when they're two family houses. And so, you know, they're pointing out at the occupancy and, you know, everything. So I think that um, we need to talk about that. And I think we have to come up with some very firm recommendations. Okay, um, Jesse. Yeah, I was going to bring that up as well. And if we have a date for that discussion, I'm trying to assemble some of the rental data by neighborhood for us to talk about too. So if yes, that's the date, I'll make sure I have something ready to share with the group. Well, we don't have much of an agenda yet put together, so we can put that on the list. Yep. Karen. So we can we can email you some of our wild ideas and our imagination of what like I I can picture this whole thing being geothermal, doing the whole street geothermal, having really wide sidewalks, keeping those beautiful trees that are having, having green space uh, along between the street and the sidewalks. That's aesthetically so much more inviting than the pictures you showed, which don't have that at all. It's all cement. There are a few spindly trees there that aren't very big yet, but I think it can be done better. And one cautionary thing is we just can't have it look anything like King Street in North Hampton. So yeah, Go ahead. I, I just, yeah, I, no, great. I, I'd welcome the comments. Um, yeah, I mean, one thing is interesting, you know, we're oh, most of the buildings, and so, you know, we're getting a lot of utilities, right? A lot of compressors, a compressor for every unit. And so that's something that we hadn't considered a few years ago, but I think, you know, moving forward, right, what is the utility, you know, what is that, where where are they, what does it look like? So I know you said geothermal, but I think, you know, solar, heat compressors, heat pumps, what, you know, where does it go? Um, I think that's really important. So, you know, if you have a an 80 unit apartment building, where do you have 80 compressors? You know, are they, is it on a wall where do you have 80 meter, 80 electric meters, you know, is, can we screen that from view? How does that work? And so. All right. So the time is 7.49. Well, maybe we'll go ahead and go to our next item on the agenda. Fred, um, you're on. This is a discussion of owner occupancy and subdividable dwellings. Presentation by Fred Hartwell and discussion of the benefits of owner occupancy and subdividable dwellings. Thank, Thank you. You. Uh, you should all have, and it should also be available on screen, uh, a redacted uh, copy of an actual tax return. Uh, before I get into that, I want to talk a little bit about uh, owner occupancy on, uh, on multifamily. Uh, the, uh, yeah, this is, this was part of the packet. Uh, and it's also, uh, it's also been arranged to, so that it can be projected uh, as part of this meeting. Before I get into that, just in general about uh, owner occupancy, uh, the uh, uh, the the rental picture changes uh, significantly with owner occupancy. Uh, my wife has a saying that I very much agree with, and that is, "You pay or you pay." Uh, 
Um, and uh, what uh, I've found after uh, 51 years in this business is that uh, it pays and we choose to pay, it definitely pays to rent below the market, uh, often significantly below. And uh, it means that we increase the quality of tenant. And that's a business decision that we choose to make. And that is something that often happens in an owner occupied one or two family or three family, either one. Uh, because you're you're creating a neighbor and uh, just naturally there's going to be a calculation that goes into that that is different if from a this the same number of units managed by uh, a corporation somewhere it's just natural and uh, we also know that the incidence of noise complaints are almost vanishingly rare from owner-occupied uh, apartments uh, as opposed to uh, ones that are not. So there is a, a, an enormous benefit to encouraging owner-occupied uh, rentals. Um, and I... I think people are, are, are generally aware of this. And I think they are generally aware that uh, there's something to be gained in terms of having rental income. That, but what I've found is that most people don't understand that not only is there income, but it is enormously tax advantaged. And so I thought I would go through, uh, and uh, as I said, we we have these. It's it's redacted, but this is a a Schedule E. This is the same uh, form that I've been filling out as part of uh, tax returns for 51 years. This is this is Schedule E. It's Schedule E 51 years ago, and it's still Schedule E today. And uh, if you look at column A, that is a three family owner occupied. And you see 30,470. I can tell you that 30,000 is rent. 470 is the uh, quarters that go into the coin operated laundry, which uh, was put in again to increase the quality of tenant because if tenants that you want we found tend to be people who would prefer to do laundry on premise somewhere and not have to drive to a laundromat. So again, this is a business decision, but 30,000 in rent. Uh, and uh, then you look at uh, line seven, cleaning and maintenance. Well, here's the way that works. Uh, this, is a this is a three family. Uh, the uh, owner occupied part of this is about uh, 40 percent of the building and the two apartments are about 60 percent of the building the way irs treats this uh, that means that for general uh, maintenance activities for example mowing the lawn 60 percent of that is deductible in effect because it goes in this line and anything that that's on line seven is going to come out of the 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 income this is the way this works uh homeowners insurance 60 percent of that uh shows up here on line nine um the legal and professional fees that's the uh, uh rental registration fee uh, the uh repairs that's uh, you when I, when I repair something in an apartment, that's 100% because that, that has no general. Uh, taxes, property taxes, 6,215. That is 60% of the property taxes due to the town of Amherst. Now, I think probably all of you are aware that as of the 2017 tax changes, which are major, 
nobody is uh, itemizing deductions anymore, which means in effect, you lost the ability to write off property taxes. You got a higher standard of deduction, but you don't write off property taxes. Well, 60% of these uh, of these property taxes in this case are part of the business operation. So yes, there is uh, a deduction here on line 16. Um, and uh, the, the I'm gonna just uh, mention something here. If you look at line uh, uh, utilities, line eight, that's 17, that's obvious. Uh, and again, in some cases, it, it depends uh, if it's the owner's meter for the, uh, that I deduct 100% of that. If it's uh, the propane for the uh, laundry, I deduct 100% of that and so forth. That this is uh, just, uh, you know, and uh, things change. I, I do everything defensively. I, I've been audited three times so far. The IRS is up a dollar and 14 cents and they tend to leave me alone. But like, uh, for example, when I have the gutters clean, well, I did a rough measurement and turns out that only about 30% of the gutters are over the uh, rented part. And so I only did what goes into this equation is only 30% of the cost of the gutter clean. It's everything here you know, has to be defensible in an audit. Um, and uh, you'll notice that the the depreciation here is, is zero. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, but uh, so if you look at the rents and then you look at, you do deduct the expenses and you're down to uh, uh, 13,261. So that, uh, you know, 17,000 right there uh, uh, came off uh, and, and 13,000 appears to be taxable, but it's more complicated than that. Um, if you go to the next handout, which is the, uh, is a uh, depreciation uh, record, uh, which goes back almost 30 years. And uh, and you'll notice I'm, if you look over here on, uh, and this is just the uh, North Whitney Street. Um, this is, uh, you'll see the current depreciation is almost $8,000. Well, how does the depreciation get to be $8,000 when line 18 is zero? Well, line 18 is zero because depreciation is a passive loss. And uh, there's, a, there's an IRS form, which I did not set up, but I'll just show it to you. This is 85, 82 passive losses have to, get tested on this form before they become deductible. I will tell you they normally are. And uh, so then how does this get reported? Well, the, the, this is house is actually in a trust. And so the trust issues a K-1. This is a K-1 is how you get these things reported. It's kind of like a W-2 form, but it's for business. Uh, uh, and uh, You'll notice that uh, the uh, uh, amount of in in, in uh, block seven here, you'll have you'll see the uh, that's where the uh, income flows, and and then in block nine you see uh, code A and code A in block nine is depreciation. So um, if you take the depreciation. Now this, and by the way, this number is is one half of the total because my wife and I both receive a K-1 and we are both equal uh, uh, beneficiaries of the trust. So uh, as you can see, uh, the, uh, the $30,000 number uh, becomes uh, a 
approximate in our case in combination with another property this this uh turns out to be uh closer to one thousand dollars in uh actual taxable income and i have to say you know i i got into this 51 years ago uh not knowing exactly what would go forward but i kind of had a conversation with myself about you know I don't know what I want to do when I grow up. I was 25 years old when I had this conversation. I said, you know, I, I know I'm going to figure out what I want to do eventually, but I don't know what I want to do right now, but I want to be able to afford to do whatever the hell it is I decide that I want to do. And I know that I, I'm pretty good with law and I know I'm really good with my hands and I think I can be a landlord. And that's when I, I bought this. And now, 51 years on, there isn't a day that goes by that I don't look at this and I say, this is the best thing since sliced bread. I have, you know, I have a fixed income. I'm on a fixed income. And this is, this is a, a you know, a five figure rent and it's tax and it's totally tax advantaged. I mean, how do you, <laughs> and I, I think people don't understand and, 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 and I mean, particularly since the 2017 tax law changes that meant that we no longer could recover a lot of this stuff by itemizing deductions. We don't, we're not itemizing deductions anymore. Well, you know, that's, so uh, this is, this is uh, what I, I wanted to put this out because I don't think people understand just how incredibly uh, powerful this model really is in terms of being advantageous to the people who do it. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, uh, I want to say a little bit more about subdividable dwellings uh, because the dwelling that we're in has, it's technically not a subdividable dwelling be because it was, didn't come out of the ground as such. Now, I'm the guy that invented subdividable dwellings. I created that bylaw uh, back in the 90s. And uh, I wanted to, and that was the, the first time that the bylaw actually specified owner-occupant. And so part of that warrant article was the creation of the definition of owner-occupancy. That was part of the, the same warrant, I invented the whole thing back in the 90s. And, uh, you know, this is this is why I did it. And I, I thought, you know, it would be nice to have this come out of the ground. Well, it hasn't happened much. But my solution going forward on this is, is not to uh, abandon subdividable dwellings, but rather make that process available for existing housing stock uh, because uh, it has worked incredibly well. Uh, uh, you know, I uh, have four children that were born uh, where I am now and they grew up. And when they grew up and got older, uh, but before they left, they took up a lot more space. And uh, so I, at one point did not renew the leases in the uh, rear townhouse apartment and put a door through on the second floor and a door through on the first floor. And that part all became single family. And I didn't have to move anywhere. I did, you know, uh, I didn't have to pay a real estate commission. It, it became, you know, uh, suitable for a you know, four family, four, four children. And then after a number of years, uh, the children started to leave. I went back to the Zoning Board of Appeals, got another special permit, recreated the, the townhouse apartment in the back, it went back to being a three family. Those doors are still framed. Uh, they're behind fire code sheetrock, but that's the, everything's framed. The electric is set up so that in about a half an hour, I can transfer the entire load in the in that apartment back to 
the, the main house and then go back the other direction. Uh, and there's no reason why this has to be limited to something coming out of the ground. It could apply to this, instead of being a special development method, it could apply to anything. And it is enormously useful. And again, it promotes owner occupancy, which has all sorts of other benefits to it. So I wanted to try and put that out there in a systematic way. And thank you for your time. Fred, can we ask questions? Oh, please do. Okay, because I have I just to understand what you're you you you're using your primary example here. You had thirty thousand in rent. Yeah. You had seventeen thousand in expenses that you wouldn't have had if you didn't own this larger dwelling. Right. So you netted thirteen thousand, and that thirteen thousand is highly tax advantaged because it's only like a thousand dollars that's actually taxed. Yeah, yeah because the, uh, I can I can take depreciation out of it. Right. And uh, so that thirteen thousand is really your nest. You know, your golden goose is that big. Well, yeah, but the you know the we uh, make major capital improvement. We're constantly improving the property. Okay. Which means you did you spend know, some it, money it, you know, thirty years ago to residential rental is is a twenty seven and a half year straight line. Uh, so it's that's it's it's not the most aggressive depreciation deduction out there. But uh, again, if you look at the uh, uh, depreciation, you, you get a pretty good idea of, uh, you know, it, it adds up, uh, uh, over, over time. Uh, and, uh, and then that is a gift that keeps on giving for 27 and a half years. Okay. Great. Janet. I too have experienced this miracle. So I, I so I we lived in a two family house in Somerville, and so you know sixty depending on your percentage, whatever percentage like your roofing forty percent is, you know it's part of your expenses, lawn care, all that kind of stuff, um, and also your mortgage. So you're paying you know your mortgage interest, and so you know it's all it's all your, you know so you're if you buy a house and forty percent of the expenses are you know paid for but you're also getting rent right and so you're getting the person's paying your rent and so you're paying your mortgage or whatever and then you hit this depreciation schedule i used to say to my accountant i understand because we're you know i know what i'm taking home every month and why is this seven hundred dollars and it was because the property is constantly being depreciated even though it's constantly going up in value or holding its value and so you know it's it's a great way to get ahead and i i think um you know, I don't know how to promote the word this word, but you know, owner occupancy is a way of really getting neighborhoods kind of in better shape, under control, more community. Um, you know, I just I think it's a great thing, and people understand the tax implications. You know, and we weren't cheating. Yeah. One one other thing, uh, the uh, you'll if you look at uh, um, let's see here. Uh, Line 12 is mortgage interest. Uh, that's acquisition debt. There's no acquisition debt in column A. That's, I, yeah, I had a mortgage when I bought it and that mortgage went away a long time ago. But column B is, a, is another property and there is acquisition debt uh, for that. And I collect uh, rent on that. And so that, uh, Forty-three hundred dollars in this case is one hundred percent deductible. That results in a tax loss on property B, which is why uh, the, uh, the 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 way I was describing it doesn't quite add up because there's a there's a tax loss in B that all goes together when I, at at the end. But it, normally, you know, someone with a mortgage uh, would be very common for someone. Uh, with a you know a two family or something they're 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 probably paying a mortgage there may be a 30 year mortgage or something at this point i've owned the property 51 years that the acquisition debt is gone but uh if i had mortgage interest uh well 60 percent of that would come out of here just like property taxes uh because we're not deducting mortgage interest anymore well <laughs> yeah I can, I can deduct mortgage interest 
So again, this is a, I think it's the best thing since sliced bread. Okay. Uh, Bruce. Um, Fred's explained this to me um, previously, so I got a, a second bite of cherry tonight. Um, and I think then, as I do uh, now, that uh, um, I agree with you, Fred, uh, and I've practiced some fraction of this, but uh, I also agree that this is uh, not fully uh, appreciated. Um, and in order to get this more fully appreciated, it sounds I used to give courses uh, in MSSE. I don't know whether that still happens, but the town used to provide uh, opportunities for people to, to, to propose uh, courses that they might teach. And this would seem to be an ex extremely appropriate one because it's not just uh, uh, elevating the opportunities for private citizens to do, I don't know, whatever interesting art projects or something that might add to their life. This actually could uh, stimulate uh, 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 positivity in town um, from a development, from a, from a civic life point of view. So I don't know whether you're inclined to do this, but clearly the next step in this is to solve the problem or to work towards solving the problem of, of, of lack of uh, public appreciation. And, and uh, I know we had a, uh, a conversation in the earlier part of the year about enabling uh, um, uh, the duplexification of houses and so forth. In other words, basically creating the opportunities for owner occupancy uh, rentals. Um, that received uh, some positive uh, uh, response from members of the board. It just was coupled with a lot more complication, the complexities that um, uh, that that the course did not to be recommended to move forward. However, something like this in tandem, I think, would be a good thing. And uh, thinking about how the uh, the public appreciation of this opportunity might be broadly more broadly uh, made manifest is something that I, I encourage you to think about. We do have the ADU. I mean, ADUs are are allowed pretty pretty broadly right now. So for my single family house, I could go build an ADU, get a mortgage on it, and charge rent and fill out a Schedule E every year. <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah i just i wanted to just add here that uh uh we we, we spent a lot of time talk and as we should talking about the affordability of uh, of rent in this town and uh and and the creation of housing and uh, if you create housing out of existing buildings uh, on existing land, uh, you know that's that's the least expensive form of housing creation it is possible to create. Uh, so that's just a, that's another reason why this is very much something to look at as a as an objective okay uh jesse uh just you can add to your course for the town that yes owner occupied very tax advantage it works perfectly well for non-owner occupied responsible landlords as well can be beneficial for the town and the investor bringing us full circle so i own a couple, couple houses I couldn't afford to do another one now in Amherst because of this same issue. The, the costs have just gone up so much per house, it doesn't make sense anymore. Um, so again, just bring us back to this whole conversation of trying to keep the housing market somehow where it is. And it, my sense is it's totally driven by the conversion to, to rental units. Keep talking about it. Janet. So when I was in Somerville, I think there was like a, a tax break of like 18% on tax on property taxes. And so um, that was really nice. 
and then it's up to like 30 or 35 percent if you're on, for owner occupancy and so the tax the city is trying to encourage it by lowering your tax bill you know quite significantly so it's another another way of getting to there okay do you see any hands on the zoom pam I think we're pretty much done with the board conversation about this at the moment for tonight. And we have two members of the public on the Zoom left. If either of you want to make any public comment about the tax advantages of owner occupancy, please raise your hand or anybody in, in the room. Okay. All right, we don't see, I don't see any hands. I see one hand, Chris. I just wanted to confirm that you all have agreed to meet on November 29th. Is that correct? I think that's true. Have you agreed to meet on November 29th to continue the discussion about housing? Yes, I believe we have. Good, thank you. I don't see any objections. And... You know, we canceled the last meeting of uh, this month, um, the previous meeting. Um, we could talk about these things over Zoom, too. So, I mean, we're kind of getting to the point where we're not quite so focused on a big map in the middle of the table. So, you know, if if it fits in the agenda, we could we could think about talking about it before November 29th. Just a comment. So in other words, meet on November 29th. Well, let's plan person. to meet. And yeah, put it on your calendars. And and then, you know, I mean, we don't know how much conversation we're going to need to get to wherever we're going. That's right. Well, Nate had suggested earlier today that we could do this and possibly do it better on Zoom, especially if we had images that we wanted to show you. So uh -huh. per perhaps as we move through this process and we start to create images, we'll let you know whether this is going to be in person or on Zoom. But I'm interested to hear that you're not um, committed to having it in person. And one, Yeah, I mean, what I was thinking was like our next meeting. I mean, may, you're probably not going to be ready to talk about this again in the next meeting. But I see. like our regularly scheduled meetings could include some of this in, the, right. in the agendas. Yeah. Um, that provoked a couple of hands. Aaron and then Bruce. I think at the in-person meeting, uh, one of the prime things that we should zero in on is what is the purpose of the the university. I think that's a big one. What what of we the say, overlay? Who, yes, the Who's overlay. the target? Who are the targeted population that we want to encourage there? That's something we should all think about, and that's good to discuss in person. That would be like a big one. Okay, Bruce. Oh, I just wanted to see whether we're talking six o'clock because uh, uh, I'm having trouble um, remembering to get here at six. Well, meetings are normally at six thirty, and and I thought the the uh, this one I had two two different uh, times were given. So our in person meetings have pretty consistently been at six. Mm -hmm. Um, I would be interested in not, I, I don't like overlays. I think we should just fix the zoning. And if it's going to be a university housing district, you know, and so I would like to see an option where you just look at the kind of ugly BL and say, we'd like to rezone it, you know, to allow the things we want to see and not just put something on top of something. Because I, I think our zoning bylaw is so complicated and just the idea of another layer of complexity so what would it look like if it was just being rezoned is kind of my question. Nate? Yeah, I mean, I think the the one issue there might be that then anything that um, wouldn't be allowed in the overlay becomes, um, you know, non-conforming. It could be a 9.22, so it could be expanded through a special permit. And so an overlay allows, you know, you to focus on what do you want to incentivize with the overlay. So what, you know, 
what's there now could still be allowed, whatever the underlying zoning allows, but you're trying to incentivize something or acquire something with an overlay. And so I actually think rezoning it would, um, depending on the boundaries becomes difficult because you know there's five or six different zoning districts. And so an overlay is allowing you know something that we, we say want to happen, happen, and, but there still could be something else. Um, so, you know, I guess that's a consideration for the planning board. Do we want to make this a base zoning? I think in East Amherst, for instance, changing the base zoning makes sense, but on University Drive, it for me, it doesn't. Okay. Okay, time is 8.21. Any objections to adjourning? None noted. We are adjourned. Thank you all for coming.